Good morning, everyone, and warmly welcome to our monthly People Morning Talk discussion that focuses on the latest topics on angel investors' minds. Cool. I hope you have had a great start uh, to this morning and that you have your coffee or tea ready, or uh, maybe you're outside walking. It's a uh, lovely weather in Helsinki, the sun is shining. Um, but uh, today's topic is cybersecurity for business angels. And uh, by promoting uh, or by choosing this topic, we hope that uh, um, you will get new information on, on how you can keep your portfolio startup safe from data, data breaches and uh, such. So very important that topic that we're discussing today. And uh, to talk about this topic, we have invited here two uh, security consultants from Aspecure Corporation that was find, founded in 1988, if I remember right. And uh, so we have here Laura Kankala and Antti Vahasipila. So warmly welcome, Laura and Antti. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let me just uh, quickly show you the agenda of today. So. Uh, as mentioned, we will talk about the cybersecurity for business angels. And after that, we will have a Q&A session. We will use the Menti tool uh, where you can put your questions. But already like during the discussion, if, if you have uh, any questions, feel free to write those in the chat. And we will then uh, take those later during the Q&A. But uh, yeah, so let's get going and uh, dive deep into the topic. So before, before we actually start to discuss about the cybersecurity, I'm very um, uh, I'm eager to hear more about your background and how did you become interested in, uh, in uh, information security. So let's start off with brief uh, introductions. Uh, ladies, first, uh, Laura, could you tell shortly uh, your background and uh, how did you become interested in this topic? Sure, thank you. Um, and hi, everyone, also on my behalf. Uh, so happy to see so many of you on, on the line already. So um, my name is Laura Kankala, and I work at FSecure as a security consultant. And I help companies and organizations to uh, solve their security-related challenges. And, and a lot of the times, those challenges involve, uh, or solving those challenges involve uh, hacking or, or thinking outside of the box, at least. And um, how I became interested in cybersecurity, I think um, this journey goes back to when, when I was uh, really young and then we got our first computer and I started to be really interested in video games and, and I played so much actually that I would get epileptic seizures and my mother would have to <laughs> manhandle me away from the computer. So I was really into computers from very early age, but I think my interest for cybersecurity in general um, started a tiny bit later. First, I was interested in uh, coding and, and in compu uh, computers and just like um, building stuff. But um, when I um, went to study, I actually studied nursing for a year, which was not a great choice for someone who is afraid of both blood and needles. So, um, but there I kind of like woke up to the reality that where we are living in, that we have a lot of sensitive data just out there for, for grabs and, and the potential impact and the harm that can be caused if that kind of data is, is breached. Then um, I started to look at the systems and, and like when I was coding, for example, I started to look at the things more from the offensive side as well. So that's basically how I got interested in, in, in cybersecurity. And here I am today. Okay, great. It's a very interesting story, Laura. And thank you, thank you for sharing this with us. And uh, then, Antti, what's your story? Yes, well, uh, in the early 90s, I had a computer and a modem, and I did a lot of BBSing, so calling up bulletin board systems and chatting, for example, with other people. And uh, I got interested in a digital rights movement. So EFF was founded in 90, I think. And uh, then later, the cypherpunks mailing list that had interesting people on it <laughs> and uh, I got interested in privacy and as an extension information security as an enabler for privacy yeah. and then uh, in the kind of later 90s uh, I got um, uh, I landed a job where I could actually start applying uh, security related knowledge and understanding in consumer products oh. and well on and off I've been doing product security, consumer device and software security scenes. And for the past few years, then I decided to start consulting. So that's the story. Okay, well, thank you very much, Antti, as well. 
Um, great to have you both here. Um, so let's now dive deep into the topic, so cybersecurity. And Laura, you have worked in startups uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So um, could you maybe start by defining what is cybersecurity and what are the most common um, or some of the most common cybersecurity <laughs> threats that startups face today? Yes. So um, I think the threats out there are quite global, uh, whether the company is, is just starting up or or like already a big company. Also, because the criminals out there, they don't really, well, sometimes they may care about the company size when it comes to, for example, demands of ransoms, for example, in case of a ransomware. But I would say that in, in a lot of the cases, the threats are the same, no matter what size of a company you are. But um, uh, for startups in general, it is, I would say, what in, in my experience as well, is that um, perhaps sometimes the uh, threats are more related also to the continuity of the services and the availability. So, for example, just having someone um, DDoS or cause a denial of service to your uh, application or service you're providing can be really, uh, really, uh, well, at least this is something that I, I saw happening that they're like, instead of putting ransomware into startups uh, servers, there are these DDoS attacks that, that then... Uh, disable the business and then there's the ransoms that come with that. So um, I would say even though the threats are global, then then perhaps the uh, mitigations are not always in place uh, or as mature for, for startups because perhaps always the security is not the first thing that uh, that you're thinking of when building a startup because you're worried about uh, how I'm going to uh, pay my my people who are working with me and 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 things like this so mm -hmm. so perhaps the uh, security uh, defense mechanisms are not always as mature as with big companies yeah yeah good point so basically that's also the uh, company's maturity that has some kind of uh, second aspect as well mm. Um, but then Amsti, um, so if we think more about the, like angel investors role in startups, mm -hmm. so some angels are very active and they take four positions and some are less active and it also depends on like, how many um, startups there are in a portfolio and so, um, but what kind of, uh, what kind of risks does the cybersecurity poses to angel investors? Let's say there's angel investors on a uh, board the um, right. So uh, I think that if you are not as active as an investor, so you just like invest money but don't have a board position, then obviously your exposure is uh, mostly restricted to the investment you make, right? Mm -hmm. um, the um, the uh, I think that the main threat obviously for an investor is that you lose the whole investment which would happen if the business ceases to be kind of a going concern so the business becomes somehow unviable maybe because of a data breach and this is probably mo most um, uh, important in those types of businesses where you have uh, an element of trust in your business so if you if uh, your customers for example have to trust you to treat their data properly then if you lose that trust then you're unable to do the business anymore and like a, another type of business that would be highly susceptible to these sort of problems would be if you have some sort of virtual assets ipr or something mm -hmm. that you can't replace and that might disappear or become unavailable for example through the ransomware as a lot of us mentioning or something something like that um, of course there are like other business um, risks as well like non cyber security related mm -hmm. and some of them might be just as uh, fatal to a company um, like like these risks would be but I, I think that there's a kind of a difference uh, as an investor that if you are facing a kind of normal business risk uh, you might see that coming from distance so like uh, you see that the uh, there's a competitor emerging or somebody making another type of a play in the marketplace you might be able to pivot or you might be able to change your position in some way uh, in cybersecurity or information security 
risks could realize in an instant. Mm -hmm. And you might not, if, if you haven't prepared, you don't necessarily have the uh, capability to react and defend. So mm -hmm. that's maybe the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And then with the like risks that are associated with security in general, they they are well, if you have done your risk assessments and, and like identified your risks, then you may see some of them coming and try to mitigate them or make the criminal's life uh, at least increasingly harder. But due to the tech stack you're using or just like the dependencies and, and like with all the like supply chains that, that are involved with the developing of, of potentially software or just a service, it becomes a really big area to cover. So as Antti also said, mm -hmm. the risks can just have like be realized overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, good points. Uh, so basically, as we mentioned, that good preparation and planning, that's uh, very important. And, uh, and, and also one of the risks that she mentioned was that uh, investors can lose uh, their money if mm -hmm. there's data breach or something. Um, but then, um, what what if what are, what is the angel investors' liability if there's a data freeze? Is there some way how to like are there for example some insurances that angel investors can use to protect themselves and the startups from this? Um, yeah, so when it comes to liabilities, I think uh, if you're just funding something, then your liabilities are potentially quite limited. Mm -hmm. But if you're sitting in the board, uh, then uh, it becomes a question of what kind of decisions are being made and what kind of uh, stances are, are you taking in that board. So, for example, if someone is clearly wanting to make a breach of GDPR or the general data protection regulation, um, then if you have not voiced your uh, the, your opposing opinion, then you perhaps could be also held accountable for that. Yeah. 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 And for the insurances, actually, um, those I would say that the insurances would cover more of the operational costs of uh, recovering business and, for example, getting incident responders on the spot and, and uh, covering for some uh, downtime, for example, that is experienced. But a lot of the times these uh, insurances, they can be quite limited in scope and they cover only for the incident. And even sometimes, at least in the past, they have not even covered for, for major incidents uh, in, in all cases. Um, so it's kind of like a volatile insurance, I would say, at the moment also, because it's quite new still uh, compared to other types of insurances. So it's, it's really um, difficult to say if it's, if it's worth it sometimes for, for a company. But, um, and, and another thing is that, um, that the, uh, you cannot basically escape like legal consequences with any kind of insurances. So if you're breaching GDPR, then, then naturally um, you cannot pay the fines with, with uh, insurances. Yeah. Or, yeah. or even put the private data back into the bottle after it's escaped. Yeah, so, I mean, that's true. Yeah. If there are, for example, individual or even environmental impacts of a data breach or an information security breach, then obviously money doesn't necessarily help. Yeah. Well, it might help, but it doesn't solve the problem. Absolutely. And I think uh, insurances always, they should be kind of like an add on to everything else. So it doesn't cover for if you have not applied any kind of security measures or taking security into account when building the business, mm -hmm. then um, I would say the insurance is probably not something that will fix anything mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, great, thank you. Um, but how then, Laura, how to ensure information security in a safe but cost-effective way in startups? Because that's also important to find like cost-effective ways how to secure. Yeah, absolutely. And and as I or, or me and Antti already touched upon the kind of like the survival, uh, mm -hmm. like you have to survive as a, as a startup. So um, the investments need to be quite smart. But fortunately, security doesn't need to be always very expensive and you don't need to have a lot of add-ons. It's more about I would say that it's more about the culture around how people operate, how they uh, discuss, how they handle. For example, if someone is, uh, does a mistake and, and like how, how these kind of conversations can happen within the company. And for startups, I think one strength is that the 
overall company size typically is quite small. Mm -hmm. So the conversation and, and the kind of like the, uh, the thing is there that you can then cultivate into, into security, uh, kind of like aware mindset. And then it's always good to start doing security from the very beginning. I would say that, um, start to think of, for example, little investments like password managers or, or just like uh, some kind of logging, monitoring systems that uh, potentially are built on open source tools, for example, that they don't have to be, um, well, you need to put some time into, into that, but not necessarily other types of monetary investments. So it really pays off if you start to do it early on, because then you can scale once the business starts to grow, it's easier to scale also these controls. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Uh, so, Antti, uh, maybe uh, maybe one question from you now um, regarding this uh, same same topic. So, uh, so what, what what do you think? What are then the critical components of a good information security plan when angels and founders uh, build this plan together? Right. So, so one one key thing is obviously that you have to know your risks. So um, there are. Obviously, if you, if you look, uh, if you Google this thing, you'll find like a number of different lists, uh, like a taxonomies of weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and all, all kinds of uh, uh, like a best practices documents. Mm. Uh, but I wouldn't call these plans. I, I would I would rather think that a plan is always it always begins with the understanding of your threat model, like we say, mm. uh, what might impact you and what are your risks so maybe having a discussion with the founders ceo cto um, about what are uh, that company's like key assets and key business processes mm -hmm. and if something happens to those assets and business processes um, what sort of uh, impact that might have and now again we probably should be thinking about the viability and capability of the company to carry on the business and business operations and and the plan then basically emerges mm. from the mitigations or controls that you can invent for those risks mm. and i don't think that this needs to be like a huge thing uh it may be like a, almost an informal discussion in the beginning yeah. but it's just that you have this sort of a notion that that what you need to do. Like Laura said, for small companies, mm. uh, many of these things are actually, some of the fundamental things are actually really easy because you're starting from a blank slate. You don't have mm. that 20 year legacy mm. in your own on premise server room that you need to deal with. You can, you can just choose the right modern things from, from the start. But maybe, and Laura, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in in a especially in a startup scene, I think that um, maintaining the hygiene of the IT is one of the key things that may be a bit harder because there are all these new fancy shiny things that you want to take into use because they improve your uh, maybe effectiveness or uh, development speed or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you don't address security when you take these new things into use, mm -hmm. your like security hygiene might actually get slightly degraded yeah especially i think if you are in the business of making software i think mm -hmm. sometimes it's easier to um, get features or like kind of like plug in stuff to your systems instead of coding it on your own because it's naturally it saves time mm -hmm. and it's sometimes even more cost efficient to get those uh, kind of like external things uh, in there yeah. um, one more thing uh, i think that is also relevant uh, and maybe Ant, you can agree is that uh, when you're using a lot of these kind of external tools, then privacy is also one of the things that needs to ta be taken into account. So um, whether you're providing a service as a startup or, or a software, then if you're using um, tools provided from, let's say, US, then, then there's kind of like a cross regulate for example regulation that uh you need to take in, into account with gdpr for example how you handle data and how you pass it on to uh onto us and and so on yeah yeah absolutely um well uh good great points and uh you mentioned that so knowing the threats that's uh, very important and then uh uh, then also having an open discussion and that's where the uh, information security plan kind of emerges 
I actually found a really interesting uh, report, uh, which was uh, done in 2018, and uh, it's called Digital Trust Report, and that's uh, done by PVC. And there they also uh, had uh, done a survey, I think there were like 3,000 respondents or something, and uh, where they uh, uh, also studied or, uh, a bit about the communication between the founders and, and the board uh, regarding the, the information security. And 80% uh, of these uh, respondents said then that uh, they had been provided by a uh, cyber risk management strategy. Um, but then there were only 27% uh, that said that uh, they were very comfortable that the board is quitting like uh, reporting metrics on cyber mm -hmm. and privacy risk management. So uh, of course uh, that's, um, that there were like, I don't know what was the rest 70%, like were they comfortable or not comfortable or what, but, uh, but how to then actually like uh, follow, what are the KPIs that uh, board members can follow that they know that, okay, like everything's in order when it comes to information security. Would you like to? Um, well, this? I, mean... uh, I, I can start and then you can yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. continue. So um, I think one thing, uh, well, this naturally depends on the type of business you're in, but uh, incorporating security requirements in the KPIs is, is definitely one thing. And perhaps even, um, let's say, if you're in the business of making software, then, then you could have metrics, for example, tracking um, security-related improvements in ticketing systems and, and ask mm -hmm. for visibility through that, for example. But um, that depends on what kind of processes the startup has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's actually a practical thing that we've done with many of our clients, that they, they just make all security work visible in a ticketing system if they use one. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can you can actually distill almost like mechanically the the like information security situation from the ticketing mm -hmm. system into a dashboard. But uh, if you take a like a one step back and think about the thing on a slightly maybe more on a more abstract level, then one idea that may be helpful is the concept of a security debt. Mm -hmm. So probably many of the viewers are familiar with technical debt, which is basically meaning that if you um, um, don't address all the quality aspects of your software, uh, these not necessarily like user visible quality aspects, but for example, if the architect uh, uh, rots down because you don't do refactoring on time and all that stuff, then you accrue technical debt and you have to pay that back at some point. Mm. Yeah, there's a similar concept called security debt that if you accrue that, then it would be necessary to pay that back at some point. Mm -hmm. and, and the higher uh, level of security that you get, the more, well, it kind of accrues interest as well. So, I mean, it, it would be better if you would start with a somewhat low uh, security debt and you pay it back in small installments while you, while you go about your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think this security debt can accumulate in, in multiple ways. For example, when making software, it can be um, faster to uh, do shortcuts or when you are providing a service, it can be faster to, um, let's say, for, for an example, use an easy password for a service or leave a database open to the internet instead of going the extra mile and configuring everything uh, in a secure manner. But these kinds of things, especially if they're con continuously uh, taking place, and, and they are not addressed, mm. then these quickly, well, these kind of issues that I mentioned, they are uh, almost instantly adding to the security depth in a huge manner. But, but there can be smaller intricacies, for example, um, with the, uh, let's say you're using some kind of supply chain to uh, uh, build your software mm. and um, you're not updating that. And then in time that will become outdated, there will be vulnerabilities. So, so there is the factor of time. So, yeah. So in terms of KPI, if you're looking for something that is a kind of a goal that will show like you're doing good and you're doing bad, security yeah. might not be as simple. You can't reduce mm. it to a single number, but as a concept, uh, a qualitative concept that might be useful. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Great points. Um, so there are some KPIs that can be followed, but then the security depth level, that's, that's one. Um, mm. Is it like... 
how, how do then uh, board members um, follow this? Do they ask, like, uh, what's the level of your security net or, or the founders sent, like, monthly reports about those things? Or Well, I think it's up to everybody yeah. uh, what they feel comfortable with and what sort of uh, information they could glean from, yeah. from the uh, companies. Uh, although I, I would say that discussion is always a healthy thing. Yeah. So if you have a security plan of some sort, yeah. uh, a security plan does not exist unless you keep it up to date. And I mean, if your company is agile and you are even ready to pivot, you cannot work from a monolithic plan that never changes either. So when you are updating that plan, discussion about the qualitative security, that might be that might be the right place to have it. And then whether or not you have the updated plan available might be that indication to the board then maybe. Mm. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so then maybe one more question now before we move on to the Q&A Q &A session and while we're then waiting for the questions, I can, I can also ask one, one more <laughs> question then. I have many that I would like to this very interesting discussion. Um, but um, so let's say that um, there is an entry investor who has 20 startups or like five startups in portfolio. How to then follow all of these uh, startups' um, uh, information security levels? Do you have any tips uh, on that? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think, well, going down to the technical level, it can be hard to follow, but perhaps it can be more holistic, for example, asking about the yeah. security, like what kind of, uh, well, if you want yeah. visibility, then, for example, tapping into the ticketing system and asking for metrics from there, like, mm -hmm. for example, how many security related uh, issues are being brought up and, mm -hmm. and tickets, how, how are they handled? And, and things like this. But I think it, it can start also with, as Antti said, mm -hmm. with the discussion yeah. and with the plans and seeing that these things are not just one off thing, but they, mm -hmm. they kind of live with the company and the startup uh, throughout its life cycle and, and they, they, they keep uh, being updated as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that there's uh, uh, like two schools of thought here. Some, some uh, investors have told me that they like to uh, just like outsource the security aspect and like spending money for example on security to the CEOs or to the operational people in the company and then there's another kind of uh, block of people who think that it might make sense to have some sort of common services for example that they would offer mm. to the whole portfolio that kind of makes sense if you think about how large companies who have like multiple development teams or business units are doing this. They have security functions that try to create like common platforms, common uh, paradigms to follow, common architectural principles, for example, and share the best practices. So if you have a company uh, in your uh, portfolio that does like a top-notch work on security, why wouldn't you like your other portfolio companies to learn from that company? Mm. So it can be even that simple. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah, absolutely great point. Uh, yeah, so um, thank you very much. Uh, now we will move on to the Q&A. I'm very eager to see what kind of questions our online audience have today. So if uh, everybody can go to menti.com and then we have a code for you, which you can put there. So menti.com and the code is 33337671. So uh, let's wait for a bit so that uh, we can see the questions uh, on the screen. And while we're waiting, um, maybe maybe uh, one more question to you, Antti. So, uh, so what should angel investor do who wants to improve, improve the information security in some specific purpose that you already discussed the, about the open communication, um, mm. but what would you prioritize? Would it be like discussing or? Yeah, well, if, you, if the question is what, what would you prioritize, yeah. then like the simplistic way would be to look at your exposure in terms of investment. And then if you already know the risks and mitigations, you know the kind of what we call the residual risk of the company. And you can basically just multiply the risk uh, with your investment, then you have the priority list. But like I mentioned earlier, that, that, that some risks may 
impact individuals or mm. environment or something and they are not monetary mm. so if you want to be doing good like investors usually are that sort of people who want to make like a good impression in the society and so on then you may, may might not just want to go with that like minimalistic exposure calculation yeah yeah a lot of what's your thought on this what would you prioritize um for for investor perspective yeah um i mean uh perhaps well this comes from the like my own technical background but i think i would prioritize asking for the as we discussed the plans and and kind of like looking at the overall uh I know it's hard to kind of like see the culture unless you're actually in there, especially if you are just uh, funding a company, but try to get a feel for what kind of security uh, culture lives in there. And and I think that that comes from the openness of, of people and, and how eager they are also to discuss um, their mistakes, because I think security is also about uh, admitting that we are all vulnerable in a sense and and that we we instead of just uh, trying to brush it to the side that we we acknowledge that and, and we want to uh, do better in the future. Mm. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. So, so I can see that we have one question on the screen, so I will um, read this out loud. Um, so how would you describe the trend in startups? Are there, are there cybersecurity understanding getting better or worse in general? Uh, Laura, would you like to answer this question? Yeah. Um, in general, um, now I'm talking about uh, my, my experiences naturally with more of the software-oriented startups. I think it is uh, getting better. Uh, instead of getting worse and i think one one of the reasons is that uh, security is definitely getting more uh, exposure and and screen time so so that's a good thing um perhaps one thing that um is difficult for startups is that because things are moving so fast and there are so many different things just piling up for example the with the dependencies coming from their supply chains and and how to manage all that so so while they're moving uh fast forward uh to the future and and succeeding their goals there are a lot of things that then uh are potentially not uh taken care of mm. yeah so uh, maybe on the follow-up question to that. So uh, now, um, when uh, during the past year, everything has gone to online meetings and everything. Uh, are there some new threats that startups are facing now? Um, well, <laughs> one answer is obviously that everything is so new. <laughs> but I mean, um, the, the motives of the uh, criminal element, for example, who would be attacking, they remain obviously kind of the same so they are usually after money yeah. uh, of course every time there is a new way of working mm. uh, the attacks will adapt mm. into that new way of working and for example this remote working well obviously it, for irrespective of which company uh, which type of company you have a large company a small company it it brings uh, new threats through, for example, the uh, people's, um, even the workplace. Mm. So, of course, uh, you're using uh, non-corporate uh, infrastructure in terms of devices, endpoints and networks, all that. Um, so that might, ha might have a impact, for example. Mm. Um, but especially in, in the startup world, I would actually think that remote working probably this is just a guess but mm. I, I i think that remote working is um infrastructure and technology wise it hasn't actually mm. had that much of an security impact compared to the previous situation i don't know if you have a different opinion yeah i i agree because if we think about these large scale attacks for example with ransomware uh, these take place in well not always but but uh, traditionally in these like enterprise environment so when you have a startup you potentially have a better grasp on something that we call zero trust so so mm -hmm. that you are using your own devices with uh, hopefully multi-factor authentication and with your own uh, credentials to uh, cloud services so so there is kind of like the 
element of of treating everyone as well zero trust may sound quite negative but basically it means that uh, no one is is trusted by default inside a company's network so so in these kind of scenarios i think security can even be um uh, better or easier to apply mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you laura and Antia. we have now three more questions there so let's take those uh uh, so have cybersecurity threats to startups increased after the pandemic? Well, I think this is more or less what we already discussed, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's take the second one. So what do you think uh, will be the biggest, what do you think, what will be the biggest threats in cybersecurity in five or ten years? That's a good question. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, my personal opinion is that phishing will continue to be a big threat. So that means that um, receiving emails or through social media or text messages or even phone calls, different types of scams, or then um, trying to get you to download something or try to get your credentials to something that will be the top threat to go to because it's so easy to execute from, from the criminal's perspective. And then uh, from that, I will think that ransomware will, will keep on being a big threat in the future as well. And what we have seen also is that it's not only anymore just encrypting data and, and making your services unavailable, but it's also about stealing data. Mm. So if you're not paying up for for having your files restored, then then they will try to make you pay for for um, not leaking mm. your your data uh, online. So mm. so I think those those two will be definitely still ongoing and strong in five or ten years. Mm. Yeah, if you think about well, ten years is a long long time. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's very very difficult to uh, forecast that far into the future. Mm. But if I would need to take my crystal ball out, I would probably look at uh, things that machine learning will cause, mm -hmm. and I'm not. I'm mostly in thinking about like societal impacts of machine learning and mm -hmm. the kind of new implementations of new domains where you would actually use artificial intelligence and machine learning as very interesting areas where you would see security issues. But I don't know what those security issues mm -hmm. would actually look like. Mm -hmm. But I think that that is an area. Mm -hmm. If you take a slightly a shorter term view and if you think about software development which is also my kind of favorite type of uh, business um, there is this huge transition now ongoing um, in many cases it, startups are on the leading edge of it where you are doing like cloud native infrastructure for example and you use uh, you, you can deploy code uh, based on a infrastructure that's also code mm. and what this causes in terms of uh, security threats is that your whole operational environment becomes defined and accessible from a single developer's laptop basically yeah. so this change that previously there probably was some sort of an operational team that handled your operations now your entire business can hang from the will of one developer mm. on a keyboard it's a good thing because it also offers a lot of security bonus like good good uh, things for security and definitely for effectiveness and robustness and all that but uh, there are mm. threats there that need to be understood yeah and just expanding on that i think also um the supply chains uh, that I've already mentioned a couple of times, but uh, because of the way we are developing software, I think those will be increasingly um, difficult also to secure, but something that uh, also we as security industry need to figure out ways how to how to deal with that. Um, well, that's actually a very good follow-up question to this. So, is there any kind of checklist that to start with in startups, so that investor could easily to understand, even look some basic potential underlying problems? I, I'm, I'm, I, yeah. <laughs> well, like, I, it probably was like evident from my previous comments that I'm not a great fan of ready-made checklists, mm -hmm. uh, but um definitely 
um, what you could do is that you could uh, have a kind of a spheres or domains that you could discuss through. Mm -hmm. So, for example, discuss your product or service as one domain and and what do you need mm -hmm. to uh, be able to provide that product or service in sustainable fashion and what risks are there. And then uh, the other discussion is probably your like like a IT operation, so whatever, like mm -hmm. a non-product, non-service related business operations, mm -hmm. uh, which may be about even your email, uh, your access to other systems and all that. Uh, so don't think that, I don't think that, for example, taking a checklist for, let's say, software security will be a complete answer for all of your startup security needs you have to think of these different operational domains that you have yeah yeah definitely and i think checklists uh, checklists always imply kind of like that there is always kind of like the same way of of doing things and i think with startups uh, especially is that uh, you're trying to do something uh, quite differently so I think it always is worth the effort to just sit down and discuss uh, the risks as, as potentially you would discuss for the business than, than from security perspective as well. Mm. Yeah. Of course, there are cer certain verticals that um, right now they start to have actual standards of how to do security. So automotive, industrial control systems, maritime, uh, all these, they, they have actual IEC or ISO standards that you need to follow. Mm. So if that is a checklist, well, they are kind of checklists as well. Mm -hmm. You could treat them as such. So those would need to be taken into account, obviously. Mm. And they actually are pretty well uh, reusable across industries. So especially if you are mm -hmm. that sort of an industry where you produce hardware or embedded devices, mm. then that sort of material is well available for your products. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's take this uh, one more question and then move on. I actually forgot my watch home, so I'm not sure what the time is. But, uh, uh, so let's take this one more. Any specific differences based on geography or all threats or all, all threats global? Um, I think the geography matters in, in where the criminals reside, uh, but for, for the threats itself and, and wherever you're conducting your business, uh, basically you can target it, uh, you can be targeted from anywhere. So that's the kind of like the uniqueness of, uh, of security as well, that uh, no matter where you reside, if your things are online and potentially even like at least your email is, is provided in a cloud service. So you're always accessible from everywhere. So, so that is, yeah, threats are global in that sense. Yeah, threats, threats definitely are global, I agree. If you need to be compliant and if for, in many cases, uh, for example, privacy compliance mm -hmm. falls under the security people's umbrella in some way or another, there, the regional differences may be actually quite significant. So there are co countries um, that require, for example, a copy of your customer data to reside within those countries. Usually these countries are, I would term them like non-free countries. Uh, so if you, if you are going on such markets, then you will be exposed to uh, regulatory risk, uh, which is very closely related to security risk. Hmm. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Laura and Antti. It was uh, great to have you here sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, so if there's an angel who would like to maybe talk about this topic more or learn about this topic, is there some way to contact you or where they can find more information on this topic? Yeah. Call us. Call us. <laughs> email. Email works as well. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, but feel free to reach out to us as well. I, I'm more, or we are more than happy to continue discussions if needed. Sure yeah. thing, yeah.